So, uh, welcome to this uh, second part in which uh, we are uh, going to focus on uh, the forward problem uh, for reduce order modeling, namely, basically, our main object of interest is going to be this mapping over here and the solution manifold that I introduced uh, before. Um, the lecture is uh, going to be divided, roughly speaking, into, again, linear approximation of the solution manifold, in particular for elliptic problems. And the second part would be, will be about uh, relatively novel suggestions uh, that are nonlinear approximations for uh, parametric PDEs that are uh, not elliptic. So uh, I would like to start by uh, fixing some examples. I started uh, the lecture with uh, this uh, very basic example. I am going to review a bunch of other PDEs to just try to convey the flavor that uh, we are looking at very diverse uh, objects now. So uh, <coughs> this uh, first class of problems that uh, we may encounter are these elliptic PDEs in which the parameters are going to be uh, the diffusion coefficient and a sigma over here. Often the solutions are uh, posed in H10, for example, for this simple problem. And the parameters here, as I say, uh, are this A and sigma. In the beginning of the lecture, A was this uh, theta. Uh, I took it constant for the sake of simplicity. In general, it can be uh, a, a field in, in space, an A of x, and uh, the same for sigma. And we are assuming that these fields, uh, they are compact sets of uh, some ambient space here uh, in particular. For example, we can think about them as being in L infinity. Uh, here's an example of possible solutions when I take in uh, the 2D square uh, a field, A of x, that is uh, piecewise constant in uh, four uh, different uh, regions. And I, when I vary, uh, the, the parameters of, of this field are going to be the values inside of each uh, of these regions. AI are going to be parameters that I vary. And when I vary them, I generate different solutions that look like here and uh, that we will play with uh, in Augustine's uh, computer lab later on. Uh, a second uh, family of PDEs of a very different nature are pure transport PDEs. Uh, in this case, uh, the uh, parameter can be the velocity A, for example. And uh, here we can see the type of solutions that uh, we may encounter uh, when uh, we have a velocity that goes into, in fact, I think it was into this direction over here. Uh, we, we see a, uh, th this kind of uh, extremely discontinuous solution um, when uh, we have a discontinuous field uh, A over here. And uh, we see that uh, these uh, equations are uh, for the forward problem extremely complicated to, to solve uh, with classical finite element methods. In fact, in order to uh, discretize them properly, we need to resort to adaptive techniques and it, it's a kind of a pain to do so. So if I have to do this every time I'm given a new parameter, I mean, uh, this is uh, going to be a no-go. So I would like, again, uh, to replace uh, this parameter to solution map by something easier. The third example are conservation laws. Here, the game is that I have an evolution in time of a solution U uh, that is uh, following a flow F over here. Solutions are often in L1 and they uh, preserve mass. So they have an underlying structure in which uh, the integral uh, in, in space uh, is equal to one. We have uh, plenty of uh, examples that uh, belong to, to this class. Berger's equations, KDV equations, the Kamas of home equation. So how can we uh, compute uh, accurately uh, these solutions with uh, reduced complexity is actually uh, a modern question in a model reduction. Uh, the, the, the picture is not so clear how to do it. Uh, finally, a last example could be Hamiltonian systems. These are uh, evolutions uh, of uh, equations in which uh, we have a, an underlying Hamiltonian structure over here uh, for which uh, we take the gradient and uh, multiply by a skew symmetric matrix. And uh, this define a Hamiltonian system 
in the sense that uh, we preserve certain structures, namely the Hamiltonian is preserved along trajectories and the flow map, uh, the mapping from the initial condition to the solution uh, u of t, it has to be a symplectic transformation in the following sense. Uh, if uh, I uh, borrow an example uh, from a fantastic uh, book by uh, Heirer, Lubitsch and I don't know who else, we can understand what this means by this picture. If, if I start uh, from a cat in uh, my face space and I start evolving the cat through the flow, in fact, the cat is going to be deformed, but its area is going to be preserved. And so these uh, equations have uh, this, uh, this structure that uh, when, I, when I have to uh, deal with these mappings, uh, I may want to preserve uh, in order to uh, consider that I am happy with my approximation. So all this is to say that uh, we have a whole zoo uh, of PDEs that uh, we would like to address. Uh, here I'm recalling the setting that I wrote uh, on the board uh, at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, I am uh, summarizing this by an operator equation B u <laughs> depending on parameters theta equals zero the solution u of theta belongs to a Hilbert or a Banach space in general. Uh, the parameters theta lie in a compact set, capital theta. Our solution map uh, reads as uh, uh, given here on, on the slides, and the solution manifold is the image uh, of theta through, uh, the, the, through the u. Um, maybe a remark I would like to say is that the manifold, to some extent, we could understand it as a decoder map itself, uh, following from the previous notation. Uh, if I take C as in fact being the parameters and I take my decoder as uh, being the mapping U from the parameter to the solution, in fact, I get a nonlinear set VP, that P uh, being uh, the, the number of parameters uh, over here in my uh, in my parameter set. So to some extent, in fact, uh, this uh, solution manifold, we, if, if we want to push it, it's a decoder. But we don't want to use it. Because even if uh, we, the, the amount of parameters, even if it may be reduced, uh, going from the parameter to the solution may be uh, really costly. And again, uh, relevant problem classes in which uh, we may need to evaluate plenty of times uh, u of theta are parameter optimization, inverse problems, and uncertainty quantification. And so we want to develop methods to replace this parameter to solution map and this manifold with a small complexity. And a very nice way of summarizing the idea is that if uh, these parameter dependent PDEs are uh, these uh, very cute uh, rabbits, I want to kind of keep the idea of the rabbit, but uh, kind of uh, present it in a more concise form, and therefore I get this uh, pixelized uh, rabbit that is uh, removing the redundancies from uh, three things that are the same to, to one that is uh, giving uh, the, the gist of it. So we, on our side, our task is going to be, again, a decoder, uh, that is uh, going to go from our parameters to a certain approximation space Vn, and this Vn is going to be chosen by the user, uh, such that whenever I'm given a new parameter theta, the, map, the mapping A of theta, uh, it has uh, to approximate the solution U of theta the best I can. And computing A of theta must be faster compared to computing U of theta, therefore, I cannot uh, use as a decoder uh, A, I cannot pick U, I insist. Uh, and uh, the dimension Vn in which I am going to land, it should be small in order to claim that I have a complexity reduction. And again, uh, all uh, the uh, art of a model order reduction is going to have to, to rely on how to choose and how to build this approximation set uh, Vn to, to, to have a good approximation. Uh, again, I'm uh, going to uh, give this uh, slide on now the uh, evaluation of a decoder map that I may use 
to uh, approximate uh, this uh, solution uh, mapping. It's uh, again the same story as before. Uh, I want to look at the error, for example, in the average sense. Uh, I vary uh, theta and I look at the distance between u of theta and uh, my algorithm a of theta. I, I, I look at their uh, distance and if I assume that theta follows a certain probability distribution, I can look in average uh, how I am behaving for all the elements of, of my manifold. Uh, similarly, as before as well, I can uh, evaluate uh, the quality of an algorithm through uh, the worst uh, case performance. And ideally, again, uh, we would like to work with the best mapping, namely with the mapping A uh, that goes from the parameters uh, to a certain given Vn. Uh, that uh, minimizes uh, the approximation error. And the mean here is uh, going to run over all decoders, all possible sets Vn, where I fix the dimension, the complexity to be n. Okay? So uh, you give me a budget of uh, n degrees of freedom. What is the best set that I can ever choose? And in addition, even if uh, this is not in this arc mean, is this computable and is this fast? Now, if I restrict my search to linear spaces, uh, here, I restrict <coughs> to be in, in a linear space. Uh, now, the approximation is going to be reached, in fact, by an optimal uh, space, Vn opt. I am, again, in, in this... Uh, in this word over here that I described in the beginning of the lecture. Now K, the compact K, is our solution manifold over here. And the question is, I want to search for uh, the best linear algorithm that is going to approximate my compact set uh, capital M. Uh, the VNOPT over here is uh, the one that is uh, on the slides. And uh, again, the, this optimal performance of uh, the best decoder uh, up here, in fact, it is given by the Kolmogorov and width that I introduced in the beginning. So the best I can do over here to reduce the complexity with a linear space of dimension n, it is given by the Kolmogorov and width. And uh, we are going to have this situation. Uh, v and opt is going to be characterized like this. In, in this picture, in, in the blackboard. Uh, again, uh, we can also consider the Kolmogorov width in the average sense, and uh, the best we could do is this weighted Kolmogorov width that I introduced as well, and for which the best space is given by singular value decomposition. Now, when the solution manifold uh, is generated by an elliptic or a parabolic problem for which the coercivity is not very nasty. Uh, there's a result by Cohen and Devor in which uh, they prove that uh, this Kolmogorov width decays exponentially fast in uh, the number of, in the dimension of, uh, the, of the linear space Vn that I may want to use. This is fantastic. It's a killer. I mean, uh, one cannot dream of something better. Uh, it, it decays uh, extremely fast. Uh, so this means that uh, we do want to use linear approximation for these elliptic problems. Now, the issue is that beyond elliptic problems, in general, we, we, want, we need to go nonlinear. Uh, a first uh, result to convince oneself about that is that for a pure transport or a wave propagation problems, it has been proven that uh, the Kolmogorov uh, width usually decays uh, worse than 1 over square root of n. And so 1 over square root of n is, uh, roughly speaking, uh, if even worse than uh, using a finite element approximation. Or, I mean, it, it means uh, just solve your problem directly, don't do model or the reduction. If, uh, you're going to only benefit of uh, this kind of rate, it's, it's not worth doing. So we, we, need, to, we need to go nonlinear uh, beyond elliptic problems. 
before going uh, to nonlinear, let me explain uh, how we work uh, for elliptic problems uh, in, in, the, in the linear approximation setting. Um, the, the catch is that even if we know that the best linear spaces, if using the VNOPT gives me a fantastic exponential decay, in practice, I need to know how I want to uh, compute my VNOPT. And in general, in fact, I will not be able to compute it exactly. What happens is that uh, there's a, a procedure, uh, a greedy procedure, that is going to give me a suboptimal VN, but for which uh, it has been proven that the rate of decay is similar to the one of the Kolmogorov width. So that uh, replacing this VN opt by something that I can compute is kind of uh, not a dramatic step, and we can still benefit from, from the great rate of decay of, of, of the N width. So the algorithm goes as follows. Um, to compute this uh, VN in practice, we are go going to have to sample our manifold. We have to uh, generate solutions, u theta 1 to u theta k. Okay, so I am not going to be able in practice to view the whole manifold continuously. I can only understanding by throwing some samples over here. And uh, then I'm going to run a greedy algorithm. The greedy algorithm uh, goes as follows. And so this algorithm, by the way, uh, we will uh, uh, program it uh, later on uh, this, this afternoon uh, in, in an example. Uh, it's an algorithm that is going to build a VN iteratively. Uh, we start uh, from dimension one, and the best element, uh, the, the first element that we choose is going to be the element of my discretization of the manifold uh, that has uh, the, the largest uh, norm. In fact, the initialization is not so important. I could, I could take uh, any element here. It, it would work uh, just as well at the cost of maybe inflating by a constant uh, the result. Um, I, I take a, a first function, u1, and then what do I do? I, I assemble uh, the, the span of it, and iteratively at step n, what I have been given is a, a, a linear um, space of dimension n minus 1, and I need to decide what is uh, the element of the manifold that I want to add to my team of functions to generate the, the next uh, space of, uh, of dimension n. So for this, what I am going to do is uh, the, to, do, to do this step. Uh, basically, intuitively, what is going on is that, again, I have my space. I have built a Vn minus 1. And this is going to be my approximation step at, n mi at dimension n minus 1. Now I am looking for the function from the manifold that behaves the worst with respect to Vn minus 1. So probably this is going to be this function over here. This is the one that maximizes the distance u minus pvn of u. That's, uh, that's the one. And since this is the one that behaves the worst, I'm going to add it to my team of functions in the hope that in the next step, I mean, the one that behaves the worst uh, for uh, Vn is going to be, become better and better. So that's uh, the spirit of the greedy algorithm. And uh, if we do this procedure, it was uh, proven by uh, Binef Cohen, Damen Devor, and uh, plenty of collaborators that if uh, the um, Kolmogorov width decays at a certain rate, uh, regardless of algebraically or exponentially, then the sequence of spaces Vn that I have built with this procedure, in fact, it uh, presents the same rate of decay with constants that, uh, I mean, they are a, a little bit uh, different from the original ones, but uh, the, the change is uh, not very significant. And uh, what is the main message is that 
the nature of the decay, if it is exponential, it is also preserved uh, with, the, with the practical uh, space that I'm going to be using. So this is fantastic news uh, for the field and it is used uh, extensively. Um, there's only maybe one caveat I would like to uh, remark. It is about the sampling. Uh, here, uh, in fact, uh, this result that uh, I am claiming over here, uh, it, is, uh, it was rather formulated instead of for this M tilde with the samples, it was uh, formulated for the full M. Meaning that uh, when I do this step, I really maximize over all functions uh, of my manifold and I really discover the exact one that, that, that really realizes this. In practice, this is not possible. I really need to sample. There's a, there's a little gap over there. Uh, the, there, there, there are results on explaining uh, why this still works uh, with samples, but I mean, this is a current line of research to, to, to have statements that say, okay, I, I can sample my compact uh, at a level that doesn't go through uh, uh, epsilon covers of the manifold and uh, it still works and everything's fine. So th this little step is, uh, is, is a bit uh, still missing in the theory. The second thing I would like to uh, remark is the following. Uh, I have now uh, an approximation A that is saying, okay, use as a reconstruction A of theta. In fact, for, for this A of theta, I am suggesting to take the VN I have built with my, re with my greedy algorithm and uh, to reconstruct a U of theta with its orthogonal projection. But in fact, this is not feasible because in order to compute the orthogonal projection, uh, oh sorry, this is a phi i or a ui, I mean, su suppose my basis is our orthonormal phi i's here, uh, I need to assemble this kind of scalar products of u theta against phi i. So to compute this, I really need to have the solution u of theta. And so our game is that we want to go from theta to something that resembles u of theta, but I, I, I cannot use u of theta because it's too expensive to evaluate. So this is not admissible as a mapping because it is still too costly because I made the uh, forbidden operation of using U of theta. So there's a, a whole lot going on in model order reduction in order to replace this orthogonal projection by something that is admissible in, in this space. I still work in the same space VN that I have computed but I make uh, my approximation doable uh, and without uh, using U of theta. This is often done by what they call here Galerkin projection. And uh, I think uh, in order to discuss uh, more in depth nonlinear approximation, I am going to uh, just skip the details and uh, just uh, make you uh, aware of the fact that when we are at this step, it's still not really computable. There's a, a couple of further steps in order to go here. It's not very difficult, but uh, I, I'm going to, to skip the, the details. The main conclusion I would like to draw from all this discussion is that linear approximation is a very solid approach for elliptic problems. So just please don't throw a non-linear approximation uh, to, to, uh, to an elliptic problem. It's uh, kind of an overkill to some extent. Now, if we want to go beyond elliptic problems, uh, we really do need non-linear approximation. So this is a, a very active uh, field of research at the moment. I have uh, made a selection of uh, interesting uh, suggestions that are uh, uh, out there at the moment. Uh, the first uh, uh, has been called a nonlinear compressive reduced uh, basis. And it's a very recent paper by Cohen, Farad, uh, Agustin Somacal, my student, and uh, Yvon Made. What is, what's the idea here? Uh, take a Hilbert space and uh, compute an SVD for a small dimension n, or, or compute a, a good approximation space for a small dimension n. We can also throw the greedy algorithm, okay? One is optimal for the worst case performance, 
for the worst case uh, Kolmogorov width. The SVD is optimal for the weighted Kolmogorov n width. So I, I have this uh, approximation space Vn. And now, uh, for every uh, theta uh, in my uh, parameter space, uh, in fact, I can uh, always view uh, u of theta as uh, its orthogonal projection into the space Vn that I have computed and uh, a component in, uh, in the perp of, uh, of Vn. Uh, and so this uh, would be, roughly speaking, the one that I get from a linear approximation modulo, maybe a, a, a feasible step that uh, uh, we said that the orthogonal projection is not really feasible in model order reduction, but modulo some uh, change, I have this term, but I don't have this term. So this term over here, it can be uh, written as an expansion of a certain approximation coefficients times uh, the the, the basis functions uh, of my space uh, Vn. And the main idea that uh, they uh, propagate in, in this uh, work is to say, we want to use the coefficients uh, a1 of theta, an of theta, uh, that we have computed uh, from our linear space, and we want to use them to approximate uh, to the best uh, we can the, the component in the perp in order to improve the approximation quantity. So we want to build a decoder that takes n coefficients and brings us to the perp, uh, such that uh, whenever I am fed with an A of theta, I feed it to my decoder and I, I get the, the best approximation I can of, of the component in the perp. So now the question is, how can I parameterize the perp? And, uh, the approach that they take in, in this work is, uh, is as follows. In fact, they don't compute the SVD or the greedy algorithm only to dimension little n. They say, okay, so go, uh, like, a, uh, go like a beast and compute this uh, to a very large dimension, capital N. Now I have my original linear space in which I'm uh, approximating and I have an approximation of the perp through uh, the components n plus one to phi capital N. And so now I say, okay, I, I, I want to work with a new of theta that is approximated uh, in uh, up to dimension of capital N over here. And the best I can do with this kind of approximation is to pick the AIs as uh, the elements of the orthogonal projection and the BJs as well as the orthogonal projection. So all the game is going to be that I want to build mappings that are going to mimic the effect of this optimal BJ with a certain procedure. I want to build mappings BJ that are going to take, in fact, uh, the coefficient say of theta from the linear space. I am going to send them through a decoder mapping, psi j, and then hopefully this gives me something nice that uh, I'm going to use as a coefficient for the elements of the perp. So the idea is uh, both uh, simple and uh, beautiful, and the, the way they, they do it in practice in, in this paper is that uh, they choose the decoder psi j among a certain class f of parametrized decoder functions. And uh, I suppose you're guessing what I'm going to say. In fact, this uh, set of parametrized uh, decoders is going to be a neural network. So what we do is that uh, we discover uh, the mapping of psi j by risk minimization. We sample theta one, theta two, theta capital K over here we uh, compute with a forward solver u of theta i in order to, to get these reference values that are the target ones we would like to reproduce. And we are training uh, the, the function from our parametrized set f as uh, taking uh, the a1, a n coefficients and resembling the best we can to uh, to the ideal coefficients uh, that, that, that would be needed. And in, in the work, so they, they use uh, neural networks with uh, certain coefficients that I 
summarize here as, uh, as C. So they eventually train a, a neural network in this form and the, the final game is to find a set of uh, good coefficients uh, that are uh, going to, to, to mimic the coefficients of an orthogonal projection. And this is repeated for all j's, all j's here in this expansion from n plus 1 to capital N. So for every coefficient, they are having a different neural network that they are using. Uh, there's been an alternative strategy uh, in, the, in a similar spirit uh, proposed essentially by uh, Farad and uh, Karen Wilcox, uh, Rudy Helen and uh, collaborators. The alternative is as follows. I again want to build a decoder that takes uh, my coefficients a of theta and approximates uh, the uh, component in the perp of my target u of theta. Now, what they do is uh, they take uh, the, the, the given coefficients a of theta and uh, they, they build a, a tensor product out of them, uh, meaning that they assemble the cross products a1, 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 a2, uh, a1, an, a2, a1, and so all the products a, i, a, j. This uh, gives them a vector of uh, size r to the n square. Then what they do is that they eventually want to work with this kind of ansatz. They have the ansatz in the linear space, the usual one. Then they go to the perp by saying, we are going to impose this uh, cross uh, product coefficients as the coefficients of our expansion. And now we are going to search for the best basis functions from the perp that are going to give the best approximation of my u of theta. And this is going to be trained in an empirical risk minimization fashion. I take a bunch of theta i's, I assemble a loss function, and I learn over the phi tilde's ij's. That's uh, the, the main idea of it. Uh, if we want to compare both uh, strategies, the, the one uh, by uh, Agustin and uh, the one here by uh, uh, Wilcox and uh, Farad, here, in fact, assembling these coefficients is extremely trivial and uh, finding the uh, basis is involved. In Agustin's approach, uh, finding, uh, the, uh, it's finding the coefficients through this procedure is kind of more involved because I, I have to kind of uh, discover a bunch of coefficients, but the coefficients of the expansion are fairly clear and they are easier, so they are kind of they put the difficulty in, in different places. Uh, I have uh, borrowed uh, these results uh, from the paper by uh, Rudy Helen and uh, Karen Wilcox and uh, the last collaborator, I don't remember who it is, to, to show that uh, their idea is, uh, is interesting and it, it has potential. Uh, they consider here a pure transport problem in which they have this kind of pulse propagating to the right. And so they show that uh, with uh, uh, a naive uh, linear approximation without any component in the perp, uh, we get uh, reconstructions that uh, are suffering from uh, a lot of uh, oscillations. And uh, with their approach, uh, they kind of seem to mitigate uh, much, much better these oscillations. So the bad thing is that they they still do have these oscillations. Uh, and also, uh, the approach uh, scales uh, fairly quickly in the complexity because we are dealing with n to the square coefficients as soon as we go to the, to the perp in, in their approach. So I think there is uh, still room uh, for, uh, for improvement, but the idea seems very original and, uh, and it seems to, uh, to, to do uh, things that we feel like having. This is another example they have in their paper in which uh, they address a, a wave propagation problem. And uh, they uh, basically, uh, here the way to read this is uh, that uh, the green or the red color is uh, like the reference where uh, the, the wave is really located uh, in, the, in the exact solution. And the other color is uh, the one that uh, is produced by, by their uh, reduced model. 
So we see that uh, the method can uh, very accurately capture the, the propagation of, of the waves. And uh, if we look at, uh, at a cut of the solution, um, the, the red one is uh, the one with their approach, and uh, we see we can of, uh, uh, reproduce much better uh, the, the solution to, to the wave equation. So uh, both works uh, seem to uh, bring a very interesting ideas to the field uh, of a nonlinear approximation. Uh, are there any questions so far? I'm going to move to uh, other ideas uh, for nonlinear approximation. Questions? About the empirical risk minimization problem, uh, is this problem uh, convex or non-convex uh, usually? Uh, let me see. Uh, that I this one? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, very non-convex because F is going to be a neural network in general. Uh, and how, um, uh, how do you deal with the local uh, minima? Is the local minima fine? Oh. Well, uh, you should ask uh, Agustin. <laughs> okay. Agustin. <laughs> I think, in principle, I mean, the problem of local minima will appear in general in any neural network approach in general. But sometimes, if the approximation is good enough, you, you don't really want to be the actual optimal because then you may overfit in these cases. So, in general, having a good op an, an optimal that is not necessarily the, the, the best will be enough. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you have to do some, some work. It was not so easy to, 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 to re actually learn uh, the, 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 actu the, 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 the neural network in this case. Also, another approach that we used there was like with random forests. And with some kind of cases, there's also a nonlinear approach that can give you uh, very good results in this case. Other questions? Yes, in the previous work, the coefficients a are built through classical Galerkin approximation, right? And yes. And then you build a neural network to, to learn how to uh, compute the coefficients b. Based on what labels are the coefficients b built through Galerkin approximation and then you learn to reproduce these coefficients? Yeah, that's exactly the spirit, yes. Okay. And just so I, I follow, is it because computing the coefficients b online through Galerkin approximation is too costly? Exactly. Ah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the questions? Uh, with, with this kind of methods, uh, is it possible to enforce some uh, structure in the in the solution, for example, positivity preservation by manipulating the basis one uses to approximate the, the, the functions? Uh, that's uh, exactly where I wanted to go next. Okay. Uh, this, uh, this works so far. You, can, uh, you could say they are brute force in the sense that uh, they, they do not uh, preserve, they, they, they do not uh, aim at uh, preserving any special properties uh, like uh, the one that you're uh, saying. Probably one could say that uh, maybe the elements in the expansion, the phi i's, we could try to build them a bit kind of in a special manner. But uh, the, the, the way of uh, working with these uh, coefficients is a bit brute force uh, to some extent. And uh, there are uh, contributions in which uh, we try to take certain geometry a bit better into account. And uh, I'm going to present uh, one of these contributions next. Thank yeah. you very much. Um, what is a typical choice for the ratio of capital N to uh, little n? Capital N is the... Capital, yeah. Uh, yeah so, uh, Agustin, can you answer this question? 
uh, I will say in principle, I mean, it depends which is probably the, the error you want to achieve at, uh, at the end. I mean, if uh, you are okay with certain epsilon error, probably then you could search the big N until you are sure that your, your reduced, the full basis will achieve that error. But then, because you don't want to compute that actually online because that will be too costly, then you get a small n so that you can get the approximation uh, to the big n with a low cost but still achieving the epsilon error you, you want. Are no, uh, no. Principle is more like a problem depending, yeah, exactly. No, yeah, no, no, not a lot of theory so far. And so the performance of the mapping from the A's to the B's. In fact, you could connect it with uh, the, the notion of um, sampling uh, width that I introduced in, in, in the previous lecture. I did not comment a lot on it. There's another width that is coming here into play. So somehow uh, there's, there's still a lot to understand. Yeah, but for instance, the other approach, they use little n squared. Yeah. Right, so I yeah. would expect that capital N over little n should uh, be unbounded. The capital, capital N? N over little n should be quite large. Definitely. Yeah. And so this is, uh, this is one objection that I think uh, one can give to these methods. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, so in the, in the work uh, by uh, Helen and uh, Wilcox, for example, they end up with, I think, bases of dimension, I don't want to say something wrong, say 150 or even 200 or even more, so that was large. <laughs> yes, um, this question also relates to the optimization part, I guess. Uh, can you use any information coming from the linear model to use it as, for example, initial points for the quadratic model? So basically to get some information there to use it probably better to the optimal point from the linear model. I, I could not uh, follow very well your question, sorry. So one of the problems, because it's highly non-convex yeah. optimization, can you use information about these coefficients from the linear model to use it as initial points to converge in your quadratic model? Because you said you're not sure that's the optimal point. So there is no strategy in using a starting point. I don't think uh, there's a known uh, good strategy for a starting guess. Uh, uh, no, right, Agustin? Or uh, I, I, I don't think. Uh, yeah. So these are works. They have uh, just appeared. Uh, yeah, definitely. For they sure. are. Uh, this is extremely novel ideas. Yeah. Okay. Uh, questions still, no. What time do we have for the lecture? So, uh, Thirty. Uh, okay. So half past, but we need to be at half past. The yeah. yeah. Sounds so good. Really great. Yes, yeah. very good. Okay, so I suggest okay. so we continue now. So the, the objection to this works is uh, a bit what, what some of you have you remarked, and little n square is not so small, and uh, the coefficients uh, bj, they, they are learned a bit brute force. We, we do not enforce any extra information we may have on, on the solution, like positivity, or other properties. I would like to uh, react to this by uh, discussing a recent contribution that has been done for Hamiltonian problems. This is an approach in which uh, uh, they have uh, successfully added a much more geometrical structure to the problem, uh, to, to, to their approximation. So the challenges in uh, Hamiltonian problems are that uh, they often transport uh, local structures, as uh, you see in, 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 this, uh, in these solutions. They, they are propagated. Uh, this is an impressive example of a, of a shallow water problem uh, with a wave uh, propagating. So uh, these uh, types of functions are typically extremely bad approximated by linear methods. And um, the works uh, that I have just presented, they, they could be a possible cure to this. Uh, an alternative uh, has been introduced for these Hamiltonian systems. I uh, remind you that they, they have this structure, they, they uh, come with a, a Hamiltonian function, 
uh, th for which I am uh, going to take the derivative with respect to the, to the first variable, and then I, I have a, a skew symmetric matrix over here, and uh, this, these problems are propagating in propagated in time. And they have these two uh, key geometrical properties of uh, preserving the Hamiltonian along trajectories and being a symplectic transformation. So the previous uh, works I have presented, they, they do not uh, satisfy these properties. Uh, the alternative is uh, to go uh, by dynamical low rank approximation. This has uh, been uh, proposed by uh, Hestaven and uh, Pagliantini especially, and uh, their collaborators. The idea is the following one. Now, uh, we, we, in, in a time-dependent problem, uh, we can view the manifold in, in several ways. If I uh, propagate, if I consider my problem in an interval zero capital T, uh, I can define my manifold for all the functions, all the states in space through the whole time interval, zero capital T. By this, I mean the following, uh, let me erase over here. Okay, so time advances. <clears throat> I have a parameterized problem with different states that I am now summarizing through, through these points over here. And so I, I am going to generate different trajectories for uh, di different values of theta, right? So this is gonna be a theta one. This is uh, going to be the solution for a theta two. I'm assuming that the parameters uh, do not vary with time, by the way. So uh, I can consider as my manifold, I could consider the whole states through zero capital T. In uh, V, say, okay, so suppose my, that my solutions are in space are in L2 of omega, this is, or L1, and uh, And this and uh, this is one way, one first way of uh, viewing my manifold. I consider that the solutions at all times they are points of uh, fields that are in space, and uh, this is one first way I, I could view my manifold, and I may want to approximate. The idea in this work uh, was to say no, no, but in fact, uh, what we want is to view this whole set as uh, fixing a time and uh, viewing a time-dependent manifold of functions of, uh, of, of uh, elements m of t. Okay, and so the m of t uh, would be defined as uh, I have in, in my slide over there. So it's kind of a naive uh, remark at first but it has dramatic consequences because uh, it is the difference between wanting to approximate all elements at all times with some approximation strategy or maybe wanting to approximate all elements at a given time, which is a much smaller set, with something, but this something has to change with time. So this is the approach uh, they have uh, developed uh, in these works. And the idea is then uh, to take this uh, slice of the manifold, m of t, and to approximate it uh, with a linear uh, space vn. But now the catch is that the linear space evolves with time. So we have uh, <coughs> the time-dependent uh, linear ansatz, uh, un of t of theta, which is going to be an expansion of vectors vi, these vi's are going to be spatial fields, 
and they are going to evolve with time and they are going to generate a linear space. Here it is of dimension 2n because in general in, uh, in Hamiltonian problems they, they have uh, coupled variables so they always have uh, they, they, they always uh, have a, a not, uh, an even number of, uh, of variables. So such a strategy is called a dynamical low rank and so uh, the objective is how do I build this uh, Vn uh, that evolves with time and uh, how do I compute these coefficients? Each of them is uh, going to depend on time and also on my parameter. Before explaining to you uh, what they did, just uh, trying to convince you that going to the slices m of t is a great idea. If I take the slices m of t and I look at their SVD, uh, the approximation error is uh, kind of uh, decaying super fast. It's, uh, it's like a dream. But if I take the whole uh, time interval, I am going to get this kind of rate of decay, uh, which uh, maybe it's in fact not so bad, but uh, compared to this uh, slices m of t, it's, uh, it's kind of not convincing at all. So I, I really, it convinces uh, that uh, one may want to work with this m of t. Uh, so so we, we want to uh, approximate our functions with these ansatz and the ansatz is uh, simple in the sense that if uh, we uh, view uh, our functions in, uh, in R uh, to the power n, uh, th these functions they are going to be large column vectors and I'm going to assemble them in uh, a matrix uh, V for which uh, the columns are going to be the column vectors and the coefficients uh, here, I'm going to gather them in a vector C of coefficients. What I want, in fact, in order to preserve the structure, I want that uh, my basis vectors, the VIs that I have gathered in my matrix, I want them to be orthosymplectic in order to preserve uh, the structure of uh, preserving the area uh, through the flow of the solution. Okay, so this, it means, in fact, that there are some conditions that uh, this matrix V now needs to satisfy. I need to satisfy uh, these uh, two equations, uh, meaning that I want my, uh, my basis vectors to be orthonormal, and this is the condition to be symplectic. This is uh, what, they, what they add as a condition. And uh, the way to go now is as follows. So suppose that I start from a good uh, linear space Vn at time zero. So at time zero, I have made my favorite SVD uh, of the initial conditions, or I have uh, made my favorite greedy algorithm, and I have a Vn of zero. I also have the coefficients uh, C at time zero uh, for a bunch of, uh, for a bunch of uh, parameters theta. So theta 1, theta 2 to theta k. I, I have uh, my representation of my uh, original uh, starting uh, condition. The goal is uh, to uh, compute the evolution of uh, u for these uh, samples, theta 1 to theta k. I want to represent them, as I was saying, with this uh, uh, linear expansion that depends on n. So it means that, in fact, these vectors they have to be approximated by my favorite uh, matrix uh, of uh, basis vectors V of t, and there's going to be a uh, matrix of coefficients C of t. Now, to have a symplectic uh, low rank integration, what we require is that this product matrix over here, okay, I want it to, to be of the form of a product uh, of a matrix V times uh, another matrix C, and the v here, which are going to be the basis vectors, I say that they have to belong to the uh, set of orthosymplectic matrices, and the coefficients, c, they are not just simple coefficients, in, in fact there's going to be a condition on the rank of this matrix, the, this matrix has to have a certain a full rank condition. And so the contribution is to say that when I approximate my solutions with this kind of ansatz over here, it means that I am in, in this set of matrices. This set of matrices is a manifold. 
in uh, the Riemannian sense of the term. It has a tangent plane and I can define curves over it and, uh, and I can define an evolution on, on the manifold. And what they did is that they searched for a solution U such that in fact the derivative of, uh, of the solution it belongs to the tangent space uh, of uh, the set S of matrices that are of interest to me uh, through uh, this kind of uh, uh, Riemannian evolution equation. So I, I am saying that my solution belongs to this uh, complicated uh, Riemannian space S and I define an evolution that uh, stays always uh, in, in, this, uh, um, in this manifold uh, by, by this uh, kind of uh, evolution which is uh, very known in uh, Riemannian integration. And uh, as soon as we impose, uh, we start writing down uh, what this means, we are going to get conditions on the evolution for uh, V dot of T and C dot of T that are going to lead us to uh, integration uh, of, uh, of these equations and this is how we are going to, to get a V and a C here that are going to evolve in time. So uh, the construction therefore relies on identifying a good geometric uh, structure here connected to the Hamiltonian uh, properties of the problem and then formulating what they call a low rank approximation uh, of, the, um, of the dynamics uh, through this kind of evolution over here. So uh, they, for problems, uh, uh, for certain problems that are uh, very complicated for linear naive approximations, they, they can get e extremely nice results uh, such as uh, this one, this is an evolution uh, through a Schrödinger problem in which uh, they start from this uh, kind of uh, thing and then as time evolves we are uh, going to, be to translate the main part of the wave to the right and we are going to create oscillations. These oscillations uh, are physical, we really want to capture them. They are not like a bad artifact of our numerical solver. And so we can see that uh, their techniques uh, capture absolutely wonderfully uh, the, the oscillations. And this is done with a, a, a very reduced amount of degrees of freedom. I cannot uh, say exactly what's the dimension n of uh, the reduced basis here, but I guess n equals to 10 or 15 is uh, going to do a wonderful job. So this is to be compared to the little n squared uh, of uh, the, the other works. So it seems that really adding a, a bit uh, more carefully uh, some geometrical properties of the solution can, can really pay off. Uh, this is uh, the message I would like to convey at this stage. Um, and uh, in order to continue uh, with uh, this kind of uh, discussion about geometry, uh, I would like to finish the lecture with uh, some uh, works uh, I have uh, done myself with uh, some collaborators on uh, conservation laws and uh, measure valued problems in which uh, we are going to view solutions not in classical Hilbert or Banach spaces but in Wasserstein spaces. These are going to be metric spaces and uh, they are going to be nice again because we are going to uh, respect a certain geometrical properties that, that are nice. So uh, here's the spirit of it. So uh, the, the works I'm going to present, in fact, they have, the, I initiated them with uh, Virginia Laché, Damiano Lombardi, and Fix Vialar. And the results I'm going to show you, uh, they, they were uh, produced by uh, my former PhD student, Hugh Do. And uh, we uh, got a lot of help from uh, Jean Feidi. Uh, a very talented young researcher from uh, INRIA who is uh, doing numerical optimal transport. So what's, what's the catch here? So uh, I am moving away from uh, the problems I, I have presented before in the sense that now I, I want to consider measure value problems. Uh, this 
it means that the solutions are no longer functions, they are measures. And uh, for which problems can, can we view the solutions like that? So, uh, in fact, for many. Uh, most conservation laws uh, can be understood as a measure value problem with a, an appropriate formulation. Volker Planck equations, uh, the classical formulation that uh, we know in a Hilbert or a Banner space, in fact, it, it, it can be uh, revisited uh, to formulate it in, in the Wasserstein space, which uh, yields to measure value pro uh, solutions. More in general, uh, Wasserstein gradient flows uh, are a very large uh, family of equations that are not covered by Hilbert or Banach spaces that are posed in uh, metric uh, Wasserstein spaces. And so there's no theory so far uh, for it, uh, except for the works that, uh, that we are producing. So the catch uh, here is that uh, for, for these classes of problems, unless we are extremely careful, uh, like uh, with uh, the works of Pagliantini and Hestaven, in which they very carefully incorporate geometry. Uh, if we work in classical spaces, L1 or L2, for example, the Kolmogorov uh, width is going to kill you. Uh, you, you, you cannot uh, go uh, with a linear approximation of this. And they transport shocks and discontinuities, and they may have non-smooth parameter dependence. So all this we have more or less said already. And the way, uh, why it is interesting of uh, viewing solutions beyond L1 or L2 or a, or a Banach space is because if I now uh, work in the space of uh, measures with second order moments with a distance associated to it, which is called the Wasserstein space, this, uh, in fact, I am going to not uh, introduce the definition of this because it's going to add technicalities that are really not so relevant for here. So, this space is a metric space. It means, for example, that if you give me two elements of the space, I cannot make a linear combination because I'm going to be out of the space. Uh, you can think of, for example, uh, elements in this space can be L1 functions that integrate to one. If uh, I, you give me two L1 functions that integrate to one, if uh, you do a naive linear combination of them, you look if they integrate to one, in general, they will not, unless uh, the, um, the coefficients of uh, the uh, linear combination, unless uh, they, they, they are a convex combination, right? So this kind of bad things happen when we go to a metric space. We no longer have linear combinations. I don't know if you realize the extent of how this has to change the mindset of uh, working with these objects. We no longer can do any, lin any linear expansion, like all the whole things that I have been written, writing so far, they, they, are, uh, they are having linear combinations everywhere. So everything becomes forbidden here. So why do I really wanna go through the pain of posing my problem here? The first argument in favor of uh, feeling a lot of pain is the metric. The metric, uh, if uh, you give me two functions that are identical, but they are translated with respect to each other, the Wasserstein distance between u and v uh, in, in the space here, it is going to be equal to the translation factor d. So if I am in a setting in which I want to locate shocks very well, because my conservation laws are transporting shocks, I, and I want to penalize uh, when I am positioning my shocks very badly, this metric is really what you want. Uh, this is to be compared to uh, the behavior of a classical metric like L1 or L2. L1 or L2, in fact, is really not going to give you any translation factor. As soon as the support of these two functions is disjoint, regardless of how far apart they are going to be, the distance between both of them is going to be equal to two, irrespective of the translation factor. So it's completely non-informative. So that's a strong argument in, in favor of uh, going to a metric space. And that was actually original, the, originally the, the argument that convinced me to, to go uh, into this uh, direction. So now, if we cannot do linear combinations, what the hell can we do in this space? So 
Here's the analog of a linear combination here. In a, in a Hilbert setting, our favorite operation is to uh, fix ourselves a basis and do a linear combination with coefficients. So now, the analog of this is probably the closest is going to be uh, what uh, are called the wasserstein barry centers. So here, I fix myself again u1, u2 to u little n measures, uh, like before, they can be the same, but instead of uh, adding them up uh, in, in the fashion of the Hilbert space, what I'm going to do is the following, I'm going to give myself coefficients that are in the simplex. Uh, they, these are uh, vectors in Rn that sum up to one and that they are positive. They are going to be the analog of these coefficients here that are originally in R in, in, in the Hilbert setting. So for, for these uh, coefficients that are now living in, in the simplex, I can define a Barry center for the coefficients and for the given uh, basis uh, measures. This uh, Barry center is going to be the element of my space that is going to minimize the weighted distance uh, between uh, the, the distance between my uh, elements and, and my target function, this uh, weighted with coefficients lambda. And maybe uh, something to, to, to visualize what this means uh, can be summarized through this uh, kind of uh, picture. Suppose that now I have this type of measures, okay? So if I vary uh, my, uh, my convex, my coefficients uh, lambda n, uh, I am going to, to get a family of uh, Barry centers and uh, each of them is going to generate me a point that is going to be either in uh, the uh, boundary of this triangle or inside the triangle. In fact, here I have uh, drawn the family of Barry centers in R2, in R right? Uh, this is a picture in R2, but maybe this is uh, something to, 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 to keep in mind as a, a guiding, uh, a, a guiding uh, visualization of what this is. So every time I fix uh, myself some lambdas, I am going to get a point in this triangle over there, and this is going to be a measure uh, in, in, in the space of interest and I can work with them, and I can compute them. That's, uh, that's the thing, okay? Um, a funny visualization borrowed uh, from uh, one of uh, Perez's papers is the following. Uh, I have a measure that uh, is representing uh, the shape of a hippo. I have a measure that uh, represents uh, the shape of a duck, and I have a torus, and I want to kind of look at the family of uh, Barry centers that are generated out of uh, solving this problem. So uh, the, the picture shows that I can go from the hippo to the dock through some sort of continuous uh, modification of, uh, of the shape and uh, the same from the hippo to, to the torus. And uh, this is often called in the field like an interpolation between the measures. When I vary the lambdas, when I vary the lambdas, I am uh, getting something that is uh, varying the shape and I am generating new measures in the space. So what's uh, our contribution? How do we uh, use uh, these things uh, to, to solve uh, a PDE concretely? Uh, the, the spirit in which uh, we have worked is uh, that we give ourselves a training data set of um, parameters and the associated solutions. In a linear approximation, I need to find, uh, in a Hilbert space, a space V of dimension little n, uh, built from these uh, training samples with a greedy algorithm, with a POD, or whatever. In the Wasserstein space, the equivalent of a linear approximation is, in fact, to uh, select uh, little n functions, measures, among my training set, with the equivalent of the greedy algorithm, but in the Wasserstein space, uh, to, to discover them 
and to uh, use uh, Barry centers uh, with uh, these measures in order to do approximation of, of, uh, of the parametric PDE. One can define a nonlinear version of this, which is as follows. Now you, you give me a target uh, parameter theta. In a Hilbert setting, I can, uh, instead of uh, fixing here a linear space once and for all, for all theta, I can try to find a linear space that depends on my parameter so that I, I adapt it a little bit. It is connected to the picture I made over here and which I, I erased, which was saying, okay, I think that uh, if uh, now I have this kind of manifold, if uh, you give me a u of theta that is over here, I may want to do a linear approximation like this with a vn of theta one, say, and here I could have a vn of theta two for other functions over here, right? So the analog in, in the Wasserstein space is to say, instead of uh, fixing little n measures once and for all, I adapt them to, uh, I adapt my selection of the n measures from my training set and that this uh, is made uh, to, uh, to depend on, on theta. Is, is the idea clear uh, so far, more or less? Okay. So um, that's, uh, that's uh, roughly the, the idea. And uh, in fact, the, the way to go about it and to, to build uh, these approximations, but in the sense of Barry centers, um, is to define uh, the notion of uh, sparse Barry centers. But I am afraid I am going to run out of time if I <laughs> show all the details about this. Let me uh, just uh, give you uh, an idea of what it can produce eventually. So we have a whole theory to say that uh, the thing is possible. It has certain optimal approximation properties. It is robust uh, with respect to uh, reparametrization of uh, the thetas. And so at the end of the day, if uh, you work uh, carefully in the space, if you select carefully uh, your uh, barycentric basis functions, like uh, in, in the spirit over here, we can get a very, uh, I think, a rather convincing results. Look at this uh, one the uh, Berger's equation. This is uh, a target uh, solution that uh, we, we may uh, want to have to approximate uh, in, a, in, in our setting. So this is the approximation of the same function with a naive uh, SVD approach with uh, only five modes. The thing does not preserve positivity. It oscillates. It is looking very ugly. So, you have to compare this with the final output of our method is uh, this one over here, in which uh, you see that uh, we almost perfectly recover uh, the function, the location of the shock, and absolutely everything is uh, almost uh, perfect. Uh, and this is done with n equals five modes. This is a tremendous, I think it is, very convincing for me to see that uh, if you start adding a bit of geometry, maybe you don't need to go uh, to, to start adding extremely nonlinear uh, mappings uh, to, to, uh, to, to do the job uh, because your encoding of, uh, of the geometry is already going to help you a lot uh, in the approximation. Another example is uh, the Kamasa Holm equation. This is the target function. This is uh, what uh, uh, an SVD approach is going to uh, give you. And uh, this is uh, what uh, our approach uh, can produce. Uh, you can see here we have a little spike uh, over here. Uh, when we published the paper in the beginning, we did not entirely understand uh, why it was present. In the meantime, we have understood it is really an artifact of uh, working with this. I mean, it's, a, it's a, an intrinsic uh, property of working with these Barry centers and so on. Uh, I don't have a, a great cure for this. Uh, we have uh, developed with uh, Pratik uh, 
my postdoc also in the audience, uh, we have some post-processing techniques that help uh, mitigate this, but so there's, a, there's an intrinsic little problem over there. We can also see that uh, we can address uh, a KDV equation uh, with a shape that in fact is not super convincing, but it is already uh, much better than a PCA, I would say. Uh, Two-phase uh, porous media, I mean, uh, again, uh, we, we can crush it. And uh, for a 2D example, uh, one thing I uh, can comment on this is that uh, working for 1D problems with this approach, uh, it's kind of still relatively friendly because we can benefit from certain closed forms of uh, expressing the Wasserstein distance and uh, certain characterizations of the Barry center. As soon as you go to more than 1D, uh, the computational pain really starts to hit you a lot. And uh, one can benefit from uh, recent uh, developments from optimal transport in which uh, they, they do uh, what they call uh, entropic regularizations and the computations uh, become much more uh, tractable and uh, easy and doable to some extent. So we, we did uh, the extension to 2D recently with, uh, with my postdoc and the results are also kind of good, although the picture I'm afraid is uh, not super convincing. Anyhow, the, uh, let me conclude this part. Um, from, from this part of the lecture, Probably uh, what uh, we can remember is that the landscape for linear approximation is very complete nowadays. Uh, there are vibrant developments in nonlinear approximation. There's uh, plenty of uh, interesting ideas uh, that have been uh, proposed at the moment. One personal message is that I feel that each PDE requires its own method. I don't think there's a kind of a a ultimate silver bullet that is uh, going to address everything uh, uh, perfectly. Uh, elliptic and parabolic problems, please do linear approximation. Don't throw a linear, uh, uh, don't throw a neural network. It's, uh, it looks very awkward. Uh, Nonlinear methods for other PDEs. Uh, two lines of research that are for me interesting are this nonlinear compressive more or quadratic manifold learning. And exploiting geometry is, uh, for me, a very interesting, promising approach as well. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs> thank you. So there are two pending questions from the part two. I'm sorry, I missed them. So I probably can yeah. answer them. Uh, it's from the online participants. So the first one is, are the last graphs comparing linear and quadratic manifolds with same n? or with the same computational costs? If n is fixed, what do you think would happen if you are given a fixed online cost instead? Can, can you say again? I mean, this is uh, related to this uh, nonlinear manifold. Yes, yeah, so the part uh, two. Uh, the last graphs, I don't know which one are they. Probably just, yeah, these ones. This, these ones? Comparing linear and quadratic manifolds with same n. Okay. Small n, not capital. I am not sure now. <laughs> What was their comparison in the paper? Uh, I am afraid uh, they only took the linear part, little n, and then they had a little n plus little n squared for their uh, plot. But uh, please take a look at the paper because I don't remember. Okay, is it okay? Uh, so the second question was how are the data generated in the example and uh, which distribution? I don't understand. That's all. Yes, I don't know if it's clear, the question. The, the data, I guess they, they generated them uh, with... Uh, it's kind of tricky to answer to the question because uh, this paper is uh, very rich in ideas. They have several layers of approximation. And uh, the concrete approximation they take uh, to be the true approximation I think it's a kind of the, the, the best solver they can use uh, for, uh, for solving their, their problem with, uh, say, a finite volume or a finite element scheme. Uh. OK, I hope that it's clear. And uh, the third one online for the, the, the last part, so slide 33, when you uh, 
Compare local time dependent Kolmogorov and width to usual ones. Is it intrinsic to symplectic problems? In other words, can we expect such kind of results for more general, more general time dependent problems? Uh, I mean, this. Uh, yes, I, I mean, I do think so, even beyond uh, problems that do not have uh, such a nice uh, geometric uh, property. I would say that uh, as soon as uh, you consider the cut of uh, working with the manifold at time t, uh, you are going to observe uh, similar pictures for other types of problems. I, I, I'm guessing, but I, I, I think this is what would happen. Okay, hope it's clear. Uh, so, any questions from the audience for part three? Hi, uh, I just I have some confusion about the uh, on the slide uh, forty. So, um, could you please explain uh, W two and L one again? Like I didn't quite catch it. Yeah. Okay. That uh, went uh, fast, probably. Uh, The main idea is that you, you take two measures, think of them of functions in L1 that integrate to 1. Just the same function translated, okay? The translation factor in, in, the, in the slide was d. It's uh, not the greatest notation, but that's okay. So. Uh, this is, uh, this, if this is u and this is v, uh, the Wasserstein distance between u and v, it is equal to the translation factor. Okay? So when, when they are both very close, the distance is very small. Okay? When they are extremely, extremely far apart, uh, with, uh, this is telling you how far apart they are going to be. This is in contrast with computing the distance uh, in the L1 sense. In the L1 sense, as soon as the supports of these things are disjoint, I mean, uh, this is just going to be equal to the integral of u of x plus the integral of v of x. And if I am assuming that they integrate up to 1, uh, this is uh, just going to be equal to 2, irrespective of how far apart they are going to be. Okay? Now, if uh, I uh, have them such that their supports are uh, still overlapping, uh, of course, this quantity is going to vary. Quantity is going to vary, so to some extent, it is also going to inform you about how far apart you are in a certain sense, but it is not going to be related to any translation factor. I don't know if this helps. So this translation factor is not uh, actually equal to the distance and uh, like um, I guess the thing I don't understand is how it helps to locate the shocks. Okay, so in, in this very simple scenario in which I have two functions, okay, um, uh, it helps me to uh, locate the shock because now if the situation is that we forget about this, okay, now suppose that my target function is of this form. This is my target u, okay? Now, with some procedure with my favorite Barry centers, suppose that I manage to build a function u n, n with uh, the amount of barycentric functions, okay? So I, I want to ask myself how far apart they are, how, how good am I locating the shock, okay? So I, I am going to penalize, I mean, 
assuming I know you, assuming I know you, I can always compare how far apart I am going to be. In fact, there's here some deception on my side because this I cannot compute because u is, is forbidden, right? u of theta, computing u of theta is forbidden. In fact, in, in this work, what we did is that, uh, yeah, okay, so there's, th th there's a, a kind of a, a deep trick going on so that we can uh, replace this by something computable, but that's the spirit of it. Okay, thank you. So short question, last point. Hi, Olga. Uh, so it, this question is regarding the results from the paper by Hestaven and Cecilia. Yeah. Uh, it says that there are uh, the whole solution itself is considered as a manifold between zero and capital T. Yeah. Uh, and then the solution is computed at each time slices of time. Yes, exactly. Uh, so my question was, how are these slices of time selected? Because of course the choice of the slice of time will depend on the approximation quality of the previous solution. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a sort of like a CFL-like condition coming from finite volume, but uh, it doesn't uh, directly so, apply here. So. so what is underlying, yeah, okay. So one thing one has to be extremely careful with uh, this approach is with the integration of uh, with, with the integration of the, the resulting uh, problem over here. And one can then benefit from a lot of research that has been done on uh, Riemannian integration. Uh, but they, they have conditions in which, I mean, the solution over time is going to get worse and worse. That is for sure. Uh, and uh, the question of uh, how you go about the discretization, it's a whole field of research. But the research exists, one can kind of leverage this and uh, what they have done uh, beyond what I have presented is that uh, the dimension little n that here it is kept constant a long time they they have uh, tried to see what are empirical methods to increase the dimension over time in order to compensate a little bit from the errors that you may accumulate so it's a it's a, it's a difficult question yeah okay so in the interest of time, I suggest that we stop the session now because you need to rush to the lunch place. You can leave your belongings here. I will close the room. So please, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks again.